everybody. Welcome. My name is Nanda Barker Hook, and I'm the president of EHOP. And on behalf of the board, I'd like to welcome you all to our sixth annual Know Your Vote Forum. Uh, we're very happy to see you all here. It's great. We have um, an audience in the room. Um, we have viewers on HCAM uh, watching at home, and we also have viewers on Facebook Live. So welcome, everybody. Um, I am here with, uh, I would like to thank I would like to give a big thank you to the Hopkinton Public Schools um, for providing this excellent venue for us. This is the second year we've held our forum in the high school library. Um, I'd also like to thank HCAM for being here, as always, um, broadcasting live uh, on HCAM TV and also making the video available after the forum online. And also to the town of Hopkinton for partnering with us on this event. I'm here with my fellow board members, um, Amanda Fargiano, Cindy Bernardo, Christy Willitson, Mary Puella, Amy Ritterbush, and Tara Sanda. And we are very pleased to welcome our esteemed panelists. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate you giving the time to answer all of our questions. Um, what I would like to do, we have a panel of 11. It's our biggest panel yet. Um, I'd like to just pass the microphone around if I can, and then if everybody could just give your name and your title, that would be terrific. Tom Garabedian, town moderator. Norman Kumalo, town manager. John Catino, <coughs> excuse me, chairman of the board of selectmen. Jean Birchman, chair of the school committee. Ellie Lazarus, Director of Land Use and Town Operations. Thank you. Do you want to try that one? It's, it's, on. it's on. It's on. It's on. Carol Cavanaugh, Acting Superintendent of Schools. Susan Rothermick, Director of Finance for the Schools. Dan Terry, uh, Parks and Rec Commission. Fran Dion. Vice Chair, Planning Board. Denise Hildreth, Director of Youth and Family Services. Good evening, John Westerling, your Director of Public Works. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, a little bit about EHOP. As many of you know, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization in Hopkinton. We were founded in 2007. Our mission is to provide timely and factual information um, on key town matters. Uh, with the goal of increasing government transparency and encouraging civic engagement. Because we believe an active and informed community makes Hopkinton stronger. Um, we are not experts in all of the matters we're going to be talking about this evening. Budget, policy, this is why we have our panel here to answer our questions. We really see our job as breaking down information to make it accessible and more understandable for the general public. And we do that in a number of ways. Um, we have an active uh, news feed online on social media. So if you're interested in receiving concise, timely, clear news about town government, um, we recommend that you follow us online. Um, we have a website that has an archive of all the town meeting votes and election votes that have happened over the past 10 years. Um, we also have lots of news articles and information about Town Government 101, um, what to expect at town meeting, all the different boards and committees and what they do and how you can get involved. Um, we also send out an e-newsletter every few weeks with the latest um, Hopkinton government policy, budget, school related news. And uh, two years ago, 2016, we launched our eHop Spotlight Forum series. And this is a series in which we bring residents and town leaders together to talk about key, timely, specific issues that are impacting all residents. Our goals for this evening at Know Your Vote are to provide the basics of town meeting, basic information, when to go, where to go, what to expect and to give residents an opportunity to ask questions about any and all articles that we're going to be voting on a week from this evening. 
So we'll start with the basics. Uh, town meeting is one week from this evening, Monday, May 7th uh, at 7 p.m. It's held in the Hopkinton Middle School Auditorium. It usually runs until 11. Um, depending on how quickly we move through the articles, it can last anywhere from two to four evenings. Uh, you have to be a registered voter um, to vote at town meeting, and you also have to be present in the room at the auditorium to vote. Three weeks from this evening, Monday, May 21st, is the town election. The polls open at 7 a.m., and they're open until 8 p.m., and we vote at the middle school Brown gym. So before we get into the q and I'm just going to uh, touch quickly on a few uh, articles. Um, there are many articles. This is just a sh small sampling. But we're going to start with a big one, which is Article 8. That's our uh, fiscal 2019 operating budget. Um, it's 88, oh, just under $89 million. That includes roughly $45 million for the Hopkinton Public Schools. This represents a 5% tax increase from fiscal year 2018, uh, which equals a $482 increase for the average home in town. And the average home is $571,000. It also represents an annual tax bill of about $10,000 for an average homeowner. And this number represents months of work on the part of the Board of Selectmen, the school committee, the town manager, all of the departments working together to come up with our final proposed budget. Uh, Article 21, Main Street Corridor Project. Um, this is a $3 million uh, item, which will fund undergrounding of utilities on Main Street between Summer Street and Ash Street, installation of lighting, and police details relating to the Main Street Corridor Project. And again, I'm going to step through these quickly, but we can come back to them and look at them in more detail as we go. Article 22 is the Campus Master Plan Study, Phase 1. This is $400,000 uh, to implement a master plan that will better accommodate parking, traffic circulation, drop-off, pickup, and pedestrian safety at Hopkinton High School. It includes adding a bus parking lot on Field 9 behind the high school cafeteria. Article 23 is the turf field project. Um, this is roughly three and a half million dollars. Uh, we're, I'm sure we're gonna come back to this in more detail, but ultimately the tax impact per average household is estimated to be $23 a year for 10 years, if this passes. Uh, articles 26 and 27 are community preservation uh, fund uh, articles, and 2% um, of our taxes annually are uh, earmarked for community preservation funds, and this go can go towards the purpose of, uh, purchase of land for open space, uh, historic preservation, and affordable housing. So there are a number of items uh, under this article. This is just a few. This is by no means all of them. Um, but some of the funds we'll be voting on would be going towards cameras at Sandy Beach, Fruit Street Fields, and EMC Park. Uh, the design and construction of a dog park on Hayden Row. Uh, purchase, two land purchases, one on Hayden Row Street and one on Cedar Street, and adding lighting at the Fruit Street Fields. Article 37 and Article 40 are similar. They're both relating to banning marijuana establishments in Hopkinton, um, excluding medical marijuana dispensaries. Um, Article 37 would amend the zoning bylaws, and Article 40 will amend the general bylaws. These would ban cultivators, testing facilities, product manufacturers, retailers, and a few other types listed under Mass General Law. Again, it wouldn't impact medical marijuana dispensaries. So um, I just wanted to let everybody know that if you have questions and if you want to follow up and find a lot of these materials we're going to be talking about tonight, you can go to our website, ehop.org, um, where you can find the meeting, town meeting warrant. You can read all the articles that are going to be voted on at town meeting, um, the appropriations committee report, which includes all of the budget numbers, uh, the town report. Um, we have a, 
a little slideshow on what to expect when you get to town meeting for people who haven't been in the past. Uh, so there's a lot of good resources on our website. Um, and there are many ways to participate this evening. Uh, you can email questions. First of all, you can bring them up at the mic in the room. Um, you can also, if you're watching from home, you can email them to knowyourvote at ehop.org. You can tweet us at hashtag hoptm18. And you can also comment um, under the live Facebook feed. And we'll be feeding those questions to our moderators. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tara Sanda, who is uh, going to be facilitating this evening. And um, take it away. Thank you. Welcome, panelists. Uh, right off the bat, I need to apologize because I'm set up behind you, so it's kind of hard. So don't feel like you have to look at me when I'm asking questions. Um, and welcome to our live audience. Um, I don't know if you've been following this program for the past six years, but we've historically done it at HCAM uh, without a live audience and with me reading from a teleprompter looking like I was uh, paralyzed in stage fright. So this is a much better feel. Um, with me, I have my co-moderator, Christy Willitson. Um, she is here because we are getting a lot of live feeds. We're getting comments on Facebook, so we have to manage that. And uh, I am no Anderson Cooper, so I do need her help in kind of managing all this information coming at me. Um, so um, I do have a message to the audience. If at any time during this program you have a question, um, whether we've gotten to that article or not, feel free to come up to the mic and ask your question. Um, the panelists are here, that's what they're here for, and honestly, the more questions you ask, the less I have to do, and that would be really good. Um, before I start with uh, our panelist questions, I have asked Mr. Garabedian, our town moderator, to start the evening off with a little town meeting 101, so kind of just a brief overview. Um, that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tara, and thank you, Nanda, for, for this uh, forum and this opportunity. Town meeting begins on Monday evening, May 7, and it's conducted in the middle school auditorium. Uh, for those who are newcomers to town meeting or newcomers to the town as well, you check in at the middle school cafeteria to pick up your voter registration card from one of the town clerk's, clerk's employees. Uh, even though town meeting begins at 7 p.m., this year, because we're going to be piloting electronic voting, uh, we, we recommend that you try to get to town meeting earlier, at least a half an hour earlier, uh, so that if you need some assistance with respect to the electronic voting mechanics, uh, need to get situated in the hall, uh, it would be uh, helpful for us. We'd like to begin town meeting at 7 p.m. sharp. And uh, as well, we need a quorum of 117 registered voters in order to conduct any business. So uh, again, I encourage people to be early and get into your seats. Uh, again, I'm pleased to announce that we're going to pilot electronic voting on Monday night, and we'll have representation from our partner organiza organization, Votes, to assist voters. And, and we'll be talking more about that later in the program. Meeting information. The warrant articles, the motions, explanatory information is provided on a table in the hall outside of the middle school auditorium. So you're encouraged to pick those up as you enter the hall. I also encourage residents to visit the town's website in order to review meeting articles and motions in advance of the meeting. The more informed you are before we get into the meeting, the more efficient the meeting itself will become. And so what is the purpose of the meeting? Well, town meeting in Hopkinton is where we as residents conduct the town's business. In effect, we're the legislature. And the purpose is to conduct that business in a professional and efficient manner. We vote on the budgets, and we decide all the rules and regulations that affect the town, obviously other than those that are mandated by the state. Again, the focus is to provide enough information so that when you're voting, you're, you're voting um, on an informed basis and you're making informed decisions. The process gets underway with sponsors of articles making motions and in effect putting the article on the floor. 
sometimes the article sponsors will have brief presentations to make. And at that point, if you as a, as a um, registered voter and registered at the meeting want to make comments or raise questions, you simply come to one of the mics that will be set up in the room, wait to be recognized by the moderator, that's me, so no shouting from the seats, and, and then make your comment or raise your questions. You'll have three minutes to raise those questions or to make those comments, and then you'll be asked to yield the floor. If you wish to make an amendment to an article, and, and everyone is free to, amend, uh, to attempt to amend an article, then in addition to making your comments, you're asked to reduce the amendment to writing, two copies please, one comes to the moderator, one goes to our technical support in the back of the hall so that it can be um, incorporated on the screen so that everyone in the hall can see it and can see what effect it might have. An article then becomes ready for a vote when someone in the audience, a registered voter, calls the question. Calling the question means uh, an attempt to end the debate so that we can proceed to a vote. If the call to question is voted upon favorably, then we immediately proceed to a vote. Most of the articles that are on the, uh, that are on the warrant require a simple majority. However, there are some that require more than that. As an example, zoning bylaw changes require a two-third majority. Once all of the articles have been voted upon, and it is my hope that we can do this within two nights, not three or four, then we entertain a motion to dissolve the town meeting until the election, and then we're done. And that's it in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I just want to make people aware of how and when the budget process starts. Uh, I think people tend to think that March and April is when everything uh, happens, but really it started back in September when the Board of Selectmen set their budget message. Uh, November is when all the departments are putting their numbers together uh, to present to um, Mr. Kamalo. Um, there's a lot of work that happens and it's an eight month process, so these people have put in a lot of time and dedication to this town. Um, so I would like to start off with the first question being, oh, one quick note. Uh, I would like to send out a special thanks for, uh, to, or to Maria Glenn, who works in the town manager's office. I can't tell you how many emails I sent her and she gets back to me within five minutes. She truly is a treasure for this town. Um, and I do a lot of drive-bys in South Street too. Um, so my first question is to Mr. Catino, the chair of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, it's a two-part question. The first part is, uh, in general terms, what is a budget message? And then specifically, what was your budget message this year? Well, typically when we put out a budget message, we meet with the uh, town professionals and see what the receipts are, or the, the proposed receipts are that, that we might be getting in. And, um, and then look ahead to see about how much we think we can spend that year or the, for the upcoming um, budget. And um, we put out that so that we can try and keep taxes uh, under uh, two and a half. And what was the part, second part of that? Specifically, what was your message for we, this year? Um, we put out there that we were trying to keep, um, keep it about three and a half percent because we did have some excess uh, levy capacity and we were going to try and use that if necessary at three and a half percent to the schools and I believe it was two percent for the town. Okay, and at the, one of the last budget meetings that I attended, the budget was broken down into the good, the bad, and the really ugly. Uh, so, Mr. Kamalo, can you please explain these analogies? And we do have your slide up there. Thank you. Um, the good, if you look at the budget that is coming before town meeting, there are really good things that the uh, town departments have identified and are hoping town meeting will, would support. There was a gallant effort to maintain and preserve the core services at levels 
and with the quality that this community has enjoyed over the years. We continue to fund part of our capital through pay as you go, relying on available funding without having to go back to the taxpayers for additional funding. We also identify capital articles that are important in preserving the town's infrastructure. So that, at least for me, represents the good, including obviously uh, the salaries that are paid to town, town staff. The bed. Over the years, we have identified the need to maintain the town's infrastructure, buildings, roads, etc. This budget that is coming before town meeting, at least in my opinion, makes an effort to get us at to some level where we are maintaining some of our in infrastructure. However, we are not putting enough money for ongoing maintenance. We are not putting enough money to fund some of our major infrastructure, for example, roads. We had hoped going into this process that we were going to ramp up the funding for our pavement management program. We were not able to do so. Also, other post-employment benefits. This is a topic that the town has discussed extensively for many years. We recently concluded our actual evaluation of our obligation, which is now estimated at approximately $29 million. Our advisors identified approximately investing $900,000 in FY19 were only funding that aspect of the budget at $400,000. The really ugly, what we heard from town residents, town departments, is that as a growing community, our needs are also expanding. Our expenses are growing. And at the same time, and I've heard this message over the last eight or nine years I've spent here in the town, we heard loud and clear from the taxpayers that we need to be mindful of the tax impact. And thus, this year, the challenge of balancing the growing needs with the expectation from the taxpayers that we mitigate tax impact was really difficult. That for me was the really ugly. We see that there's an article for senior tax relief. And if I understand it correctly, we're adopting a new law that uh, exempts seniors over 65 from increased property taxes on alterations or improvements to their home. Um, I was wondering, how are, are we making further efforts to relieve this part of our community? Yes. Um, in fact, in this town meeting warrant, there are two articles pertaining to tax relief. The first article is a standard article that provides at least up to 75% in terms of tax relief to identified and specific groups that are allowed to receive this tax relief by state law. The second article, in fact, is coming to town meeting because when we went to town meeting last year, we only approved it for one year. This is the article that provides tax relief to owners of homes who make improvements that benefit seniors who live in the home. I'm also pleased to say, through the efforts of the selectmen and also the Board of Assessors, the means tested law is currently going through the legislature and hopefully will be approved sooner rather than later to benefit our seniors. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Kapna. Um, what were the biggest challenges you faced when developing this budget? 
and how did you work through those challenges? So if you have been following our um, F9, FY19 budget process, you know that we have gone from an 8.9% increase to a 7.3 to a, ultimately a 5.8. And I think one of the things that has happened is over time, we have seen the increase of our need for English language learner teachers, so we have 2.0 FTEs there. We have an additional almost $900,000 in special education costs. Yeah. So, um, and you can see that um, we need additional, you know, custodians, for example, at the Marathon Elementary School, just because of the size and the enormity of that building as compared to center school. So with all of these changes, and I've talked about some of the big budget drivers, but those three things, just as examples, aren't things that sort of trickle to all students. They are um, things that address the needs of either a facility or a particular student. So I think that those were some of our, our, our big challenges as we went through there. Um, I don't know if Mrs. Birchman would like to add something to that. Thank you. Yeah, I think the other thing that was um, un not unusual but unfortunate this year was that it was also the year that we had to renegotiate our, or go back out to bid for a bus contract. So we saw a substantial increase in our bus contract, um, and that was particularly bad timing given some um, some other big budget drivers that happened to hit this year. So this is a, an unusually large increase for the school. Certainly the highest by far in my nine years on the school committee, um, and although it is the highest increase we've had. We actually had to reduce services that we have been providing in order to get back down to that level. I know that's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and it was, as you said before, Tara, <laughs> we started that in November, so it would be hard to, to go through all of the nitty gritty details, but that's the highlight. We began with um, many reductions in personnel before we began adding additional personnel. And we did it in that way because one of the things that we look to is who are the students sitting in front of us and how do we address their needs. And we also look at class size. So if we have fewer kids in the middle school, we've actually dismantled half of a team there. And while that results in a reduction of personnel, we did need to add people in other places. And I think you can also just take a look at one of those other slides that you had in terms of per pupil expenditure. You can see where we are. Um, we are doing quite well in terms of our ranking, despite the fact that among those communities, we are um, third from last in terms of per pupil expenditure. So I think we're doing a lot with what we have. Great. Um, if you look right over there, we are live streaming on Facebook. So I'm getting, oh, yes, oh, come on right in. Point of clarification. Previous slide, we listed seven FTEs at the elementary school, and we were showing a $496,000 increase. That's roughly $70,000 per FTE. Can you confirm that's accurate, that we gave $70,000 raises to seven unique FTEs in the school system? That's how the slide reads. That's not what the slide means. That would simply mean that that would be the salary for that particular, $70,000 would be the average salary for that additional teacher. So up there it says total negotiated salary increase. We're highlighting seven FTEs, four at Marathon, two at Elm, one at Hopkins for almost $500,000. So you're telling me that is not respective of the seven FTEs listed there? We're adding seven people at $70,000 each, roughly. And we consider that a salary increase and not a headcount increase? It's technically a headcount increase, but it's an increase to the salary budget. So we've taken some teachers away, which subtracted from the amount of money we pay out in salary. And maybe Mrs. Rodmick, you could do a better job with this. So I, I, I think what you're reading, that very first line is the total negotiated salary increase that was existing staff mm -hmm. um, before we made reduction, or you know, after we had already made reductions. So that's ah, the 91,000. It's not a header. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so that next line where you see the elementary teachers, the additions. I understand. Yes. Bolds are dangerous. I read it as a header. Okay. Just a second quick question here. 52% of the town budget to schools. I'm going to do some envelope math. It doesn't feel like 50% of the people in the town are children. Can you tell me what that looks like compared to other towns? I, showed, I saw that you just showed cost per person, but that feels unusually high given essentially what you're asking for in the budget. Roughly half of my taxes are going to the schools. 
Um, I actually, excuse me. Actually, I think that that in most towns, um, the percentage of the budget that goes to the school is substantially higher than that. What that slide was showing was the per pupil expenditure, not the per taxpayer expenditure. So what that chart is showing you is that, you know, in in Dover Sherbert, for example, they're spending nineteen thousand dollars per student, whereas we're spending fourteen point five thousand dollars per student. Um, the the ranking that we're showing you on the um, on the other column is where we ranked on some, you know, on the U.S. News and World Report survey of um, public high schools in the state. So that's the comparison there that that we're making. So actually, you know, we are pretty low in terms of our pu per pupil expenditure. If you go into other towns like Cambridge, is like twenty four thousand um, dollars per student. So you know. We don't really compare ourselves to, to Cambridge, but we try to sort of stay in this region with districts that we are compared to, um, you know, across a number of metrics. Okay. Um, so the point I was trying to make earlier um, is that we are live streaming on Facebook, and I am getting questions coming in, so I'm good, it's going to start to get a little bit jumpy, but I want to make sure that they know we're listening to them as well. Um, so the question came in um, during the beginning half of your um, answer. Is how will the school deal with budget cuts? Are there going to be increase, increases in class size? So as we looked at that, there will be some places where there are increases in class size, but we have principals in our district who sort of work as the gatekeepers of that. So for example, we may see this year that you have class sizes of 19 and they may go as high as 22 or 23. But when we formulate a budget, we can only do that on our anticipated enrollment. And so what they've looked at is who will be in those classrooms next year and what does it make sense um, to do at a particular grade level in terms of the number of classrooms that we establish. Yeah. Could I clarify something? There were no budget cuts really anywhere in the town. What we tried to do was limit the increase now, when the, when the schools came in at 7.8, or what, what some of the numbers, 8.7, 7.8, down to 5.8? 8.9, 8 yeah. You know, that was just trying to limit the increase, because originally when, we, when, we, when my first uh, question was about the, the, the budget message, it was, what can the town afford? And that's the first numbers we came up with, what the town could afford. And, um, you know, and so we hear quite often the narrative that there are budget cuts, there are budget cuts. It wasn't, it was just the amount of increase that the town could really afford. And that's what we were trying to grapple with and that's why it took so long to, uh, to get through the budget. So, um, a follow up question, that same email about asking if the class size was going to get smaller, this emailer also asked in related to budget cuts, should the board consider keeping maintaining what's already available to the kids instead of adding more projects such as the turf field. They followed up with why keep adding more when you're making cuts to things that are already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so the, those are two different budgets. Actually, there's an operating budget, which is what we're talking about on these slides. Um, and then a turf field project is part of a capital budget. And there are several different ways that those can be funded. Um, this year, the determination was made that um, if this is approved at, at town meeting, it would be funded within the levy limit. That's not within the school operating budget, um, but it's but the service on that debt would be covered within the overall town operating budget going forward, not this coming year. Um, so we are not. I want to be very clear. We are not making a choice and picking an athletic field over a classroom teacher. That is not the choice that's in front of the school committee and that is not the choice that the school committee has made. Um, is that the question that was, okay. Yep, and I, we have some other questions related to the turf project that might clear some of that up. Yep. I don't, do you wanna go to the turf questions now? All around that or not? Not yet, this person's been right Okay, so we'll jump back to turf, sorry. Like Tara said, it's gonna get jumpy. So it's exciting, it'll keep everybody on their toes. So we'll ask another question. You want me to ask them? Um, so we just want to get the emailed questions to let them know we're listening. Not related to budgets right now, but it's um, a question for Mr. Catino and Mr. DeYoung. When the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board vote to fill the vacant Planning Board seat on Wednesday, May 2nd, 
What criteria will go into considering the candidates, and more specifically, how much will or should the planning board election results of a year ago be taken into account? Well, firstly, um, we uh, pulled the uh, pulled it off the agenda for, for Wednesday. We uh, were looking at uh, doing it uh, later on, and um, uh, just because there was uh, there was uh, such a um, uh, an outcry at some point, and uh, may I comment? Yes. It's not within the four corners of this article. It really has nothing to do with town meeting. <laughs> that's, a, that's a comment for the Board of Selectmen meeting. Thank you. All right, so we're going to jump um, to talk about another email question that came in about the downtown corridor. <clears throat> Their question, does the warrant question on the downtown corridor have an eminent domain component? There is an article on the town meeting warrant regarding easements that are required to implement the downtown corridor project. As we have done in past years, the article gives, that is if town meeting approves, authority to the selectmen to negotiate for these easements. The reference to eminent domain is a tactical reference. There are instances where there may be issues with the deed. And the easiest, most efficient, and cost-effective way of handling that issue is through eminent domain. I have worked for this community for close to nine years now. I have never sensed an appetite on either the selectmen or any other town board to take anybody's land forcibly. Again, the reference to eminent domain is a technical administrative tool to resolve tightly issues. Let me follow up with this one. Yeah. So a follow-up to also on downtown corridors, they asked, can you provide a link where we can read more details on the downtown corridor project? They, says, they said there are some changes to the proposal that were shown in the forums over the winter that they wanted to find a link to. Sorry, yeah. or we could just talk about it now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. In fact, we were working on this document this afternoon we will provide a link that will outline the history of the project, what is being asked of town meeting, as well as a listing of frequently asked questions. Excellent. Um, can you explain what is included in the cost of $3 million for this project? Thank you. Um, again, to be clear, based on the information that was put up previously, the three million dollars pays for non-participatory items, meaning items, elements of the project that state funding would not pay for. These include undergrounding, landscaping, lighting, and police details. Okay, and the other question that was asked was, how will we vote on this? Is this a simple majority? Is this two-thirds? Will it be on the ballot? Two-thirds. This will not be on the ballot. It will be a borrowing within the levy. And is, uh, what part is covered by state grant? A, approximately, as of the drawings that we have now, $8.3 million will be paid for through state and federal funds. And if the town votes no on it, what will happen to that funding? Our hope, and this is the effort that we have put over the last 
five, six years, and in fact, Brian Hare says over the last 20 years, the $8.3 million project will move forward without undergrounding, without the architectural lighting, without the extensive landscaping that we have identified as appropriate for the downtown area. So all the phasing will be changed? Phasing meaning? Well, the phasing that you have set forth on your plan as it exists now, will that change at all? It, it depends on the linkages between what will be moving forward under the $8.3 million and the non-participatory items. Thus, yes, you are correct, some of the phasing may change. Okay, I'm going to take you off the hot seat for a minute. Mm -hmm. We're going to move on to the DPW. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the DPW has a comprehensive plan for the maintenance and the replacements of your machines and equipment. How often is this plan reevaluated? Uh, has the demand on your department increased in recent years? And I see that there was an article for the purchase of a new tractor that has been removed from the warrant. So we do have a 10-year fleet maintenance plan, and that looks at our entire fleet of vehicles, and it lays out their replacement over a 10-year period. We evaluate that every year because the needs of the department and the replacement of those vehicles sometimes outpaces what the town's budget can support. So we evaluate those every year, and we bring forward for consideration those vehicles that can't wait any longer. Uh, and there was a request for a third sidewalk snow removal tractor. Uh, and again, the, the budget this year simply couldn't support that. So we have taken that out of consideration and we will ask for it to be considered again next year. And I just want to confirm that you are going ahead with the purchase of other equipment this year. Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, we have a question about the Pratt Farm well field investigation and the new source approval for 170,000. Um, what is the current water demand and what is our dependence on Ashland and Westboro? So I don't have the current demand numbers in front of me right now, but it's, it's around a million gallons per day and we rely on the town of Ashland for water supply. Um, somewhere uh, the low is around 300,000 gallons per day on average, and that does increase throughout the year. Uh, it also decreases depending upon whether or not there is a, a, a drought. Uh, we do not rely on the town of Westboro for water. That's where we discharge some of our wastewater for treatment. Um, so this, this will seek to take the investigation of the Pratt Farm property that the town had purchased partially for potential future water supply. This will take this to the next level so that we can determine whether or not it is truly a reliable source for water supply. Okay, thank you. Um, next, uh, we're going to go back to the school committee and the superintendent. Um, it's about the campus master plan study. Uh, phase one, school bus parking for $400,000. Why is the bus parking lot behind the school rather than elsewhere, like on the Irvine Tadero property? Um, so to begin, the, the first real push to get the, um, the bus parking lot moving is really to address the traffic issues that we have out on Hayden Row. So currently we have both pedestrian vehicle traffic and school bus traffic all using the front of the high school, middle school, high school for all of our students. So the only way to address that traffic congestion is to do something immediately within the high school, middle school campus to separate that traffic. Um, so that's why we're looking at the field behind the high school because we're taking right off um, all of that pedestrian vehicle um, traffic and the bus traffic and we're separating that. So students that are taking the bus will exit out of the back of the high school 
and students that are going for their vehicles, the parent pickup, et cetera, will be going out the front of the high school. So it increases the safety. It gets the traffic out off of uh, Hayden Row and onto our campus where um, increases the safety again, not only of students exiting the school, but of people trying to come in and out of the campus. And will there be a savings now that we're not using Ashland? Uh, so the big benefit with doing this, you know, safety of course was our, our first driver, but the other piece is it will bring the school buses so that they are now housed within the town of Hopkinton, which then allows the excise taxes to be paid to the town of Hopkinton. So the, the town will gain 50,000 uh, approximately in excise revenue, but in addition, we were also able to negotiate the operating the bus contract down an additional 50,000. So on an annual basis, we could be gaining $100,000, um, which would be um, kind of a quick payback for, for the, the bus parking lot um, in the long term. So you're asking for funding for phase one. What is phase two and when would that be happening? So phase two is really uh, very much in its infancy. Uh, so this is really to remove, um, you know, separate the, the, the traffic between the bus and the, and the vehicles. But then we want to look at the, the full campus in terms of the traffic and start eliminating the, the cross vehicle uh, traffic. So next year you can have parent vehicles coming in using what is now our existing bus parking lot our existing parent parking lot, um, our parent drop-off loop, but to exit the campus and to exit after they've dropped off, now you have vehicles crisscrossing each other. So we've taken the congestion off of Hayden Row, but we've definitely put it back into the front of the school. So the phase two is really to look at a long-term plan of how should the traffic queue through the campus um, so that we have a, an efficient flow for parents coming, dropping off children uh, curbside and exiting without having to crisscross with each other. The potential for expanded parking, uh, once we have that bus loop where we don't have buses, now we can increase parking spaces um, for staff, for students, for um, visitor parking. So it's really looking at the campus-wide what is the most efficient way, and also going all the way down also into uh, Hopkins School as well. And just really making sure that once we remove this bus parking lot and put it behind the school, how does the rest of the traffic flow fit within our campus and is it the most efficient way? Um, yes, sure. come right up. Isn't that a question you should know the answer to before we vote to whether you can have the $400,000? It sounds as though you're hedging here and you're essentially telling us that there's a second phase where we'll review the traffic coming through the area. Can you look at me and tell me now there is no potential based on the initial phase one plan that you will need to do rework? I'd like to understand why we wouldn't be studying the effects of this first prior to asking the town for the money. Uh, actually, we already have. So we do have some alternatives, but they have not been fully vetted from the school committee. But the first step really is to remove the bus and the vehicle traffic. We could still do nothing um, after we create that bus parking lot and, and take it uh, not a step further. And it will improve where we are right now. So this is definitely a step in the right direction. Again, the uh, vehicle traffic then in the future could loop through that bus lot, loop through the existing um, parent lot, and we could say that that's sufficient. I'm sorry, it still sounds pretty speculative to me. I really want to understand why aren't we doing the full review? Why are we making a piecemeal change? And I can respect that there's a traffic component to this, but just in general, I guess my feedback to this group would be I'm going to read my own writing here, always bad. Why are we voting on future expenditures given a budget shortfall and a lack of long-term stability in the budget? I asked this question of Norman at the last EHOP. I didn't particularly get an answer I understood. I'm going to ask it here again. Given that we are facing a budget shortfall, you are asking for a significant raise in town taxes. At the last meeting, we, we discussed a potential increase or a non-leveling until 20 or 21. Why are we here discussing any increases that are not actually mandatory for town safety? That's what I'd like to understand. Am I 
Um, um, so, so it's a good question, um, and I think there are a couple of points that I'd like to make. One is this. Um, so again, we have the operating budget and then we have capital budgets, and there always is a certain amount of debt service that the town is paying on capital budgets, uh, on, excuse me, on capital projects within the levy limit. And so you'll see every department still has a number of capital projects that they've requested this year. None of them are being funded outside of the levy limit. So one of the, you know, one of the special features of this year's overall budget process, if you will, is that the library is coming online, the um, Marathon Elementary School is coming online, the DBW is coming online. So we're starting to pay the debt service for all of those projects which are funded outside of the levy limit. So the projects, I believe you said already, Norman, there are no ballot questions. So all of the capital projects that are being funded this year are being funded within the levy limit. The borrowing is being funded within the levy limit. Um, I'm quite sure that, that this is true on the town side and, and I'm confident on the school side because I was present. We have reduced a number of our budget, of our, excuse me, of our capital requests and postponed them um, to the future the best that we could. That said, there are always projects that really either have been postponed too long or cannot be postponed any longer. And I think that that's what you're seeing from all boards this year. This one in particular, um, we are going forward with this year because parents are no longer that entire red line there that you saw is where parents have traditionally queued up to pick up their kids or drop off their kids at the high school. Um, due to the traffic calming measures that were passed last year or the year before, I don't remember, at town meeting, parents are no longer allowed to queue up there. So we already had the difficult safety issue of having bus traffic, car traffic, and pedestrian traffic with kids um, all in the same place. But now we have to get all of these cars also off the road. So as somebody asked earlier about the Irvine Todaro property, there was, I know that, that there is a committee that is um, determining what the best use of that property is for the town, and they did look at bus parking. Um, it's my understanding that they haven't made a recommendation in terms of what the overall use of the property would be. We have an immediate need to get these cars off the street. Um, and in addition, that we still have the problem. We would still have the problem if the bus is parked at Irvine Todaro, we would still have the problem of where they would queue up on the high school property, which would still, again, mean that we couldn't get all the um, cars onto the property the way that we're supposed to. So. I went on for quite a while. I hope that answered some of your questions or I may have confused you more. <laughs> um, but that's why we're still moving forward with some capital projects this year. This is just a quick follow on. Um, I would like uh, Mr. Kamala to explain why we are not in a budget shortfall, short, what was the question? <laughs> budget shortfall position. As proposed, the budget that is being presented to town meeting does not have a shortfall. Right, when I say shortfall, I mean you're asking for an increase in taxes not proportional with the overall cost of adjustment from inflation. You're, so you are escalating the taxes in town. That is a budget shortfall when the 2 to 3 percent that you typically raise needs to be exceeded. We can be semantic about it, but you're requesting. Well, I do need you to step up to the mic because yeah, so it's not capturing your. Other people don't have that question that's listening because they can't hear you through HCAM, sorry. So when I say shortfall, I'm talking specifically, and I apologize for being semantic, you're asking for a larger portion of taxes to be given to the town relative to the cost of inflation and just the adjustment for living expenses. That's what I mean by a budget shortfall. That is correct. And in fact, this is a topic that was covered extensively last week at the Appropriations Committee meeting. Bear in mind, a huge portion of the increase in taxes in FY19 is from excluded debt that the residents of the town have already agreed to. Um, we have had a um, question from Facebook when you were speaking. So it's going back to the buses right now. 
Um, we had a question, is there any other parcel of land on the campus that could accommodate the buses? Um, so again, we need to have a place where we can uh, dismiss and load the students with taking them out of the front of the high school. So the proximity of loading on uh, Field 9, anywhere else on campus would require the students to be dismissed and walk all the way down the loop road to another field, if you will. Um, the, the loop road is very constrained with a lot of wetlands, so Field 9 really is the most logical proximity-wise uh, for a student dismissal and drop-off and to get them into the school safely and quickly. And we have if, I, if I may follow mm -hmm. up. Um, this is the, this is actually more for safety. Now, the, I want to clarify: the Irvine Tadaro group did um, say that uh, the only thing that that we agreed on was to have bus parking there. However, the, having the bus parking on Field Nine actually does solve two issues, and that's the the crisscrossing of traffic. Um, even even more than the bus parking is the safety aspect, and and not having the the drop-offs cross with the buses right now. This, this gets the buses somewhere else. So even if the buses did park at Irvine Tadaro or something, we would still have the, the drop-off problem. And, 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 and just when we start talking about the, the loop of where we're gonna, where the parents will come in for the drop-off and such, it, you know, the, the way I'm looking at it, all one has to do is remove the do not enter sign that, that you'll see as you're coming in here going around this way. People would just have to go around that way. They re readjust the lines and there's parking and, and a, a way to drop people off. But even more than the bus parking, this was really for safety and that's why I, I applauded the, the schools for, for coming up with this, um, this solution to, on, on, on two levels. Thank you. I'm gonna piggyback uh, a traffic um, question. Um, there have been, there was an article for sidewalks for $1.75 million that were removed from the warrant. Um, are those sidewalks uh, in part of the new school budget? And does this mean that a plan to add sidewalks from EMC Park to Chestnut are being put on hold for another year? The short answer to that question is yes, they are being put off for one more year. There are sidewalks on the westerly side of Hayden Row and there is a controlled pedestrian crossing in front of the new Marathon Elementary School. So there is safety within the sidewalks for the pedestrians that will be walking to and from the school and there's also a safe crossing at, uh, at the new Marathon Elementary School. Thank you. Okay, we are gonna switch articles now um, to the turf fields. Um, we've had a lot of questions come in about the turf field, so it's probably a good time tonight to start talking about it. Um, the first couple of questions are about the funding. How much will be paid via CPC funding? What is the tax impact, which I think we had a slide about earlier? Um, and is this a debt exclusion or borrowing within the levy? Um, so I'll go in reverse order. It's a borrowing within the levy limit. Um, <clears throat> the total cost of the project came in at, so we already have gone out to bid, so we do know the actual cost of the project, which is about $3.5 million. We worked, um, we did a, a great amount of work with the CPC committee, and they gave us two very generous grants. One is for a million dollars, um, and the other is a $720,000 grant which is actually borrowing that they will do over 10 years for, um, to pay for the lights. And you'll see there's a similar article to pay for the lights funded the same way um, to add lights to Fruit Street to those turf fields as well. Um, so the tax impact, you can see here that if with, with no grant funding of any kind, the tax impact would be about $67 per year for the average family household, including the CPC grant, it's down to $35 per year. And then in addition, the school committee has um, set a goal of community fundraising for $500,000, which would reduce um, the overall tax impact to the town to $1.3 million, which would be about 25%, excuse me, $25 per year on the average 
tax pill for the average family home um, for 10 years. This, so again, it's a borrowing within the levy limit that does require a two-thirds approval vote at town meeting, but there is not a um, question on the ballot related to this. Okay. And Mrs. Bertrand, if we vote on the current budget numbers without the private funding, without the 500000 mm -hmm. um, how can that money, once raised, actually offset the tax burden? So, as, as it was explained to me, and I'm not an expert on municipal finance, so I'll give the mic to somebody that is in a minute, the town does their borrowing twice a year. So, what we, our, our goal, we've given them a deadline of October 1st to raise through um, corporate sponsorship and, and community donations, $500,000 that would go to offset the debt service on the borrowing. So. I don't have the warrant in front of me, but I believe the borrowing would be on the $1.8 million, and the intention is that um, the $500,000 would be identified before the money is borrowed so that it would reduce um, the tax impact. Is that, is that the right explanation? Yes. Oh, all right. Good job. <laughs> I do um, listen. So if the project is completed by September, when and how will it be paid? How will it be paid? Yes. Will it be paid? Which budget will it be paid out of? So the, the money would come available July 1st because it's in the FY19. But I believe that on the debt schedule that I saw, the year zero is FY19. So there would actually not be a budget impact in FY19 or minimal. And it, the budget impact would start in FY20. Um, so, yes, so the intention is that we would break ground in June, right before for the first bills wouldn't be paid until July, so that the, um, the fields could be used in the fall. So I ho hopefully you'll have a question about this, but I'm going to just throw it out there anyway. Um, we have also worked out with Parks and Rec a management agreement. So actually, Parks and Rec will be managing all of the non-school usage for the fields. There's a revolving fund um, that all of the revenue will go into that will pay for um, all of the maintenance and it will offset the cost of replacing the carpet and the, um, which would, is probably in about 10 to 14 years that that, that would be, need to be replaced. And can you or Mr. Terry explain to us um, how you have worked out your agreement to manage and maintain these fields? Amicably. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good answer. Thank you. Actually, I, I mean, I'm being facetious, but we, we had, uh, we've been meeting for almost a year, really, on that topic. And there were, we had a lot of, um, of pieces of good luck, I think. So also, already we have a great example at Fruit Street for what, um, usage looks like, what maintenance looks like. It gives us a great foundation for understanding what the opportunities are for rentals to people outside of the town. Um, and we have a great understanding of what the demand is within the town from um, sp youth sports groups. So we also went to some other towns and looked at how they did it. Um, so we've worked out, you know, um, I think an outstanding uh, agreement, a memorandum of understanding, but basically the, there will be an oversight committee that has joint representation from the schools and Parks and Rec um, that will manage the scheduling and all of the maintenance and um, determine what the availability is for rental and will manage the revenue. And they'll meet, you know, on, at a prescribed number of meetings uh, or schedule over the year. Did I do anything about that? Um, since we keep mentioning Fruit Street a lot, we're going to switch to that, um, and it's a CPC question. Um, lots of questions about Fruit Street. Um, we talked about it earlier, but when are the, when are the nets going to be up? Where are the lights? And when will this building ever be done and we can go to the bathroom there? <laughs> uh, Tara, I thought you told me the nets are up. They are. So but I had you. to ask the question. Somebody so you wrote were, it in. You, you, thank you for that report. Based on a report from Tara earlier today, <laughs> the nets are up. Uh, but still no bathrooms. The, the bathrooms and the, uh, the new building that's being built, we're, we're, I don't have a specific timeline, but I think we're just weeks away there. Uh, there were some delays that, that uh, were caused by Eversource 
uh, getting electricity that, that caused a delay or two over the winter. The cold weather over the last, uh, over March kind of pushed back our ability to do some uh, concrete work that needed to be done and also some painting, but uh, I think we're very close with, within a few weeks. And the, there was a third question in there, Tara. Mm, the lights. Uh, the lights. The, the lights. Uh, the, the lights are a uh, CPC funded, um, it's a request that we made of CPC four lights down there at Fruit Street. Uh, they have CPC approved it and we would still wait for town meeting approval. The plan would be to have lights up uh, potentially in the fall of this year. Um, and one thing that it would certainly help us do is generate more revenue uh, on those fields in order to, uh, to contribute even more to replacement. Okay, great. Um, I did um, watch back or listen to Know Your Vote from last year. And we've voted on this Fruit Street building a couple of different times. Um, last year, there was talks about there being a separate building. They couldn't share a wall. Is there still another building going in at Fruit Street, or is that uh, there's gone? There's a lot of confusion about that second building. So, uh, well, I mean, if I, if I could start. The, the, <laughs> so there have been two votes on uh, the building that is being built. Uh, the first one was just... Uh, we had a dollar amount that was based on what some consultants had told us we could do. And then when we actually went out to, to come up with plans for the facility that would um, uh, provide storage, provide bathrooms, some concession area, and, and very importantly, some cover for during bad weather as, as people drop their kids off and, and might leave and leave a coach with 15 or 20 kids and the storm rolls in. So uh, we thought it was important to, to build a building. As we moved forward with plans and building costs and started to have a better understanding, I believe that number was 500 is where we started. As we moved forward with, with the plan and understood costs, um, particularly with getting the infrastructure there uh, to the building to get it across the parking lot, we realized that we needed to increase that budget so we were uh, fortunate enough to get another $400,000 in funding. So um, that was the cost for, for that. Okay. Did I answer? So there will not be another building? Oh, the other building. Um, we also uh, had discussions with, with certain youth groups in town that thought that it would be a good idea if we explored having an a indoor athletic facility. And we thought that given the land we had down at Fruit Street, it was a good idea uh, to go ahead and explore that. We did go and uh, Again, with some consultants, uh, come up with a number. I think the original number was five hundred thousand uh, dollars. As we moved forward with plans and met with different committees, the scope of that building changed considerably, and uh, the the cost of that building would be um, much higher than that five hundred thousand dollars that was was discussed originally. So I'd say um, that uh, I mean the Parks and Rec Commission still needs to discuss it further, but. Uh, plans are very much on hold for an indoor athletic facility. Okay, and we do have an audience question. What is the estimated annual revenue from external use for the tur new turf field and or Fruit Street? And uh, what is roughly an operational budget and who covers the shortfall um, if the estimates prove over optimistic? So, um, we, I'll take this, Gene. So, we have uh, the, the, the for the new athletic fields at the, at the high school that we're talking about, we've got a good opportunity that we've got five or six years of, of um, expenses and an understanding of what we can do revenue-wise based on Fruit Street. So um, I, I think a lot of the uh, numbers that we came up with were based on Fruit Street. Um, at Fruit Street, we see anywhere from fifty to $70,000 a year in rental income. Our expenses uh, are in the 10 to $15,000 range, and a lot of that has to do with how much additional maintenance we have to do after we plow. Um, and then we, we pretty much used that same model for the costs around, uh, around the high school fields, or the fields that would be located at the high school. So I'm, I'm very confident that there would not be a shortfall. Okay, we do have a Facebook question. Um, 
I hope I'm reading it correctly. Should the delays in the Fruit Street fields give us reason for concern that the high school fields may not be done in time for fall sports? Well, I, I can't speak to what the ways that they're referring to in terms of Fruit Street, but I will say that um, our athletic director has already worked very hard with all of the surrounding towns um, to prepare them for the fact that we may be delayed with our fall seasons because, you know, obviously any construction project can have unforeseen delays. Um, the, the response that, she, well, so first of all, the Tri-Valley League has been great in terms of um, we've only very recently been able to even get on our own fields this year because of the weather, and so they've been great. They're, it's just very collaborative. They've been great about swapping home games or, you know, taking up basically our, our slack. So it won't be the first time that they will have had to reload, ro locate a game because of, a, of an issue related to a field at, um, in Hopkinton. But in addition, Fruit Street has been fantastic. We have you know, we've been able to rent Fruit Street for our high school teams. Um, and so I think that they probably don't really think that they have full use of their fields back in September. I would imagine they're expecting that there'll still be some overflow from the schools. So we are planning for that, both in terms of um, the Tri-Valley community as well as within our own community here in Hopkinton. But we're optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to revert back to CPC. Um, uh, and it's for the design construction of the dog park on Hayden Row. Uh, the question is, what is the timeline and what approved funds in the past few years? It's not clear. How is it different? So we have allocated funds in the past. Uh, so timeline, we're, we're, uh, we're at the point now where we're starting to work through the different um, uh, committees in town to, to seek approval. Um, and the thing I'd like to add about the, about this is, uh, before I talk about the funding, is that it's really being done um, partially to develop the dog park, but more to develop the whole 19 acres in general. The, the, the dog park is one aspect of, of this, and Parks and Rec is very happy to, to move forward with this plan and, and, and to work through the, the uh, committees and, and provide funding. But a lot of the funding that has been committed towards this, um, towards this project is going to be used for walking trails and just general use of, of the property, whether you have a pup or not. Um, in terms of the funding, uh, we've worked with the Stanton Foundation. They're an organization that um, uh, has, uh, has got, it's a foundation that, that plans to build 10 dog parks per year throughout Massachusetts. We're fortunate enough that we've got $250,000 in funding from them. Uh, prior to, or, or a prerequisite to applying for that is we had to have uh, at least 10% of the costs already uh, committed by, the, by a, a group at least, and, and the town had gotten $50,000 a, a year or two years ago uh, for the development of this dog park. Um, and then uh, there's another $150,000 in CPC funds for this year. So 50 to begin with, 250 from the Stanton Foundation, and another 150 from, from CPC, again, to develop the entire property and not just the dog park. And if we're sticking with the dogs, um, Article 39 is nuisance and danger dog. Can you expand on that? <laughs> what is that article about? Is that in Board of Selectmen? Oh, tan ma town manager and uh, animal control officer. The article proposes to bring um, the town's current um, barking dogs bylaw into conformance with existing state law. So it includes the process for a public hearing and other uh, procedural matters should there be a dangerous dog or a nuisance dog, the terms of which are defined in the statute. So it brings the town up to standard with the state statute. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I encourage you, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to come up to the mic with uh, about any article. Hi, yes, uh, I have a question about the article regarding uh, banning uh, marijuana sales within the town. So we've been talking a lot today about 
spending and about the spending that we're going to be doing over the next uh, fiscal year. And I'm a progressive Democrat. I'm all for it. But uh, I also was hoping to hear a lot more about business development uh, during this meeting. And not only am I not hearing about the kinds of things that we're promoting in business development, we're actually looking at prohibiting a certain kind of industry within town limits um, and all of the uh, tax revenue that would come with it. I'm wondering if you could comment on why you think that would be a good idea, given our budget issues. I'll try and hit that one a little bit. Um, we, we heard it come up uh, at uh, a Board of Selectmen meeting earlier. One of, one of the meetings that we've had a lot of them in the last couple of weeks. And somebody was talking about uh, if um, we're losing some buildings at EMC and wouldn't it be great if we could have some marijuana shops pop up and everything else. When we're talking about EMC and we're talking about hundreds or thousands of workers and the size of their buildings, if we look at the, at the amount of revenue that a pot shop or something like that could bring into the town, uh, you know, the, way, the way that I see it and some, some of, if I, I know I can speak for a couple of the other board members, in that the um, the amount of money doesn't doesn't constitute uh, some of the uh, the issues that it brings in, you know, um, uh, any of these any of the growing facilities need need 24-hour surveillance. That might mean that we might have to have more police patrols. We might have to have more fire patrols, and 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 the, the permitting and all of that. So some of the some of the aspects might sound like that there's a lot of revenue can come in that now as a, as an investor. You know, it's, it's, it's great to invest in right now, but uh, it all depends on where you want to uh, uh, put your money. So you say it might lead to more, need, you know, require more police presence or it might possibly be more of these things. Um, have you guys done any investigations into what this might actually require? Has there been any, in, you know, thinking about if we did invite um, this industry into our community, what the costs and the benefits might actually be? So in terms of social costs, looking at um, other places where marijuana businesses have come in, there is great potential for um, expenses that come along with this. On the other side of sort of the tax revenue, which often takes uh, the center stage, so what we know about Colorado is increase in traffic accidents, increase in ER visits, increase in fatalities, increase in drug driving, increase in folks um, having drug challenges. So there's great potential for additional costs that often get sidelined when we talk about tax benefits. So from a public health perspective and a risk management perspective, um, those are the primary you know, concerns that I have. And there have been reports that have come out that there's there's not always this great potential for huge tax revenue because oftentimes the risks outweigh that revenue. I thought it was pretty clear. I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you done a study showing what the benefits to the town would be? I hear your talk about risk. I would like to know, based on other towns in the area, have you actually done an assessment? No. Why? Um, so as a... But actually, before you answer... Sure. How can we discuss the risks and how can we be having an honest conversation about the potential downfalls of having this in the community? How can you talk to us conjecturally about the risks outweighing the benefits if you don't actually know what the benefits can be? Because we don't know what the specific applications are. If we're talking about pot shops and, and some of that kind of stuff, we know that, that there would be a more of a mom and pop size operation when, when we're starting to consider, when, when people are trying to compare it to EMC and such. You know, we 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 can't we can't uh, decide. Uh, you know, we can't put do a study on on what the benefits are unless we know what's in front of us. We do know the risks. Along the same subject, um, we're not talking about. I mean, you're talking about pot shops and retail establishments. We're talking about uh, banning. We're even talking about banning testing facilities. That's a laboratory. That's a small scale. There's there's no nothing that comes along with that except for you know lab technicians and lab suits testing qualities so my perspective as you know a public health professional and a social social service provider for families and youth is that whenever we open the door and suggest that marijuana use or having marijuana establishments in our town 
decreases the perception of risk among youth, which is the population that I serve. When the perception of risk decreases, the, the possibility of use increases, and that comes with a whole host of risks, specifically for youth and young adults, and the literature is clear on that. But for any kind of laboratory that currently exists on South Street that tests other, other products, any other products, you're saying that they cannot test marijuana if it's a legal thing in our, in our, in our state? So what we're proposing is an opt-out for all of those establishments. Yeah, and we also ban uh, class four uh, testing of, uh, of, of uh, viruses and that kind of stuff also. Could I just um, interject for one second? Yeah. Can we review the two articles that are trying to be passed at town meeting um, and then follow up unless you, is no that problem. okay? That's fine. Okay. So there's two articles, number 37 and 40. Just to clear up what those two articles. So, um, article 40, marijuana prohibition. And so it is an opt out. It's a vote yes to opt out of all marijuana establishments, including cultivation sites, retailers, et cetera. Um, so that's the one that came from out of my office. The other came out of uh, planning board. And you from the planning board? From the planning board. Yeah. Some, from a similar perspective, <clears throat> as she mentioned, it's really about you know, prohibiting these type of establishments, and especially given the fact that you know, from a state perspective, they haven't made final decisions on this as well. The thought was to be kind of proactive in terms of how we approach it from a town perspective. This is Wax Lags. So I'm wondering how this would impact residents in terms of their private rights associated with marijuana. So this is, first of all, separate from medical marijuana. It doesn't impact medical marijuana. Medical marijuana is legal for those who get consultation from a doctor. And as I understand it, there's going to be um, access to medical marijuana as close as Southboro beginning in June. So I wanted to sort of put that off to the side because this is not about medical marijuana. Um, folks who are over the age of 21, it is legal in the state of Massachusetts for them to have recreational marijuana. It does not impact that. Um, what we're asking here is for an opt-out in the town of Hopkinton so that we would not have retailers and cultivation sites in our town. That's the difference. Um, well, I believe it's six plants mm -hmm. per residence. That's not part of this at all. Correct. Okay. That doesn't change. Okay, we do have a line forming, so come on up. Okay, I just had uh, a couple questions on the American marijuana. Um, first off, I want to know if any of you guys have gone into any of the dispensaries and been to a dispensary. Has anybody here, anybody in this room been to one? So we're talking about something that you haven't even been involved with. I happen to be in one today. I'm a card holder. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing shameful or dangerous about this coming to Harpington. And people who feel that way are going back to the old days where my brain and dr drugs and dropping the egg, okay? There is, uh, there's way too much stuff involved besides negative, and people ought to, you know, start looking at that. The national news and they're carrying, there's a, a drug right now that's been uh, taken to, to, for, for the little children so that they don't have, uh, suffer from uh, seizures. Uh, medical marijuana is helping millions of people. And recreation, recreational marijuana. I don't see anybody here that probably jumped up and said, "Hey, we don't need another restaurant with a bar. We've we've used all our alcohol things." Funny how these people, you know, find that acceptable when that's killing billions of people or millions. I'll go with that. And cigarettes, though, you know, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna ban this because a few people say that it's bad. So this doesn't change medical marijuana at all. And uh, I was actually on the phone with an emergency room physician yesterday who confirmed that there is good potential for medical I'm marijuana as medicine. Medical. I'm not just talking for medical. Okay. I, I, I know a medical will be, a, will be available. I'm saying that, that there's nothing wrong with recreational either. You know, it, it's a shame that people all the town would have to ban marijuana shops because they're not good enough parents to keep their children from taking drugs. And that's basically what it is. The next they're going to be coming saying, hey, we don't need package stores. I don't want my kid drinking. Oh, I don't want them smoking cigarettes. Well, those are the first two things that of the gateway drug that people like to call their gateway. And I, I have one other question, and I'll sit down. Um, one of the things that was reported um, was that the cost of running all these operations and everything would be, could be too much for the town and may not be any good. Is that the only thing that's based on is how much it's going to make for the town? 
I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now, the town could make five million dollars right now if they turn around and turn the uh, turn the uh, set of school into and uh, let them grow there. Put a fence around it. You wouldn't even know what it was if you didn't have a sign there. The same thing with the, with all these these shops. You don't even know what it is. They, it looks like a just a, a regular shop. It's not like a, they got a, a great big sign and all this. And for people to be afraid of it, you know, I mean, it's just it's sad. I, I feel sorry for y'all. Thank you for your comment. We in Hopkinton are surrounded by many other towns. What makes you think that the social costs would be any different if there's no pot shop in Hopkinton, but there are in surrounding towns? Why would it make one iota of difference? Why would it stop one person from using? Why don't we just go for the revenue? Why would the social costs be any different when we're just one little town? Um, I would say it makes a statement to our youth and teenagers and young adults about the perception of risk and what we endorse in this town. There's no data to support that having marijuana shops and cultivation sites um, enhances community life. So I would start with that. And there are potential risks to it. And, and the normalization of use does have a risk. And the studies are very clear that substance use by youth um, is, not a good, is not a good policy. Uh, I have a two-part question. Is there any evidence that any companies involved in cultivation, testing, manufacturing, retailing have been interested in Hopkinton? And then the more procedural question is, is this an article that can be um, potentially amended at town meeting or not? I can answer the, the second half, and actually I'll elaborate a little bit on the, the fact that we have two, two articles here. Any, any article can be amended. You, you can attempt to amend any article. Uh, again, we ask that you, you um, bring two copies of the amendment to the floor so that uh, it, they can be broadcast uh, both to me and to the uh, technical support at town meeting. Uh, I'll comment again as to why there are two articles uh, planning board brought forth the first one. That requires a two-thirds vote by town meeting. The uh, article that was brought forth, uh, Article 40, is an amendment to the general bylaw, simply requires a, uh, a majority. To the, we're going to take, we're, we are going to entertain uh, a motion, a procedural motion, to consider these two in tandem so that one would be considered after the other since the discussion will be the same with respect to both. Uh, if Article 37 passes, then there will be no need to consider Article 40, just as a, as a matter of procedure. As to the, to the other question, is the, has anyone expressed interest? Uh, I, I don't know. Do we, do we know? I mean, we've, all of the previous votes that have been taken in town, and there have been two or three, I believe, between at the ballot and before town meeting, have uh, indicated that there was uh, that the majority of people in town were against uh, uh, the sale of marijuana, the, the use of marijuana, and then ultimately the sale of marijuana. Um, that may have influenced whether people have uh, been interested in approaching the town for uh, possible commercial opportunities. Uh, if I could just add a comment, uh, it's Steve Slam, and I'm the Fire Chief and Emergency Management Director for the town. Um, just in preparation of this, I've been working with the Fire Marshal's Office since the fall in a couple of seminars that they've offered. Uh, they help us with uh, code enforcement, um, everything from uh, the manufacturing facilities all the way down to what we might expect to face um, in, residentially with the law passed. Um, the one thing they have not been able to offer us at the state level dealing with this yet is when I asked them what should I prepare for for the impact literally until a couple of weeks ago the reports hadn't even come out from any of the commissions that I knew of so we're still early in the uh, learning curve that's something I talked about last year at town meeting just one other point is as a community um, we run into a lot of issues um, that are challenging and we look at them from um, most recently, uh, the federal government pushes us as emergency management directors to deal with uh, community risk reduction and try to take any issue that comes into our community and say, okay, what are the pros and cons to it, and is this an opportunity for us to have some 
risk reduction with the way we deal with it. Um, there are some aspects um, that are already facing us and we'd have to back them up. This is a newer one with the legalization and now we have an opportunity to analyze um, whether, you know, how is it going to impact our community. Most of the research I've um, gotten out from the police because they've dealt with some of the data points that have come out of um, Colorado or Washington or whoever's working on it right now. And they, you know, they've had some areas where we need to, from a safety standpoint, be preparing to deal with the issue. But there's still a lot of unknowns, and that's the part from a community risk reduction that I, uh, I worry about and I wish um, we are searching. But again, when I asked to try to get some feedback from the government, there isn't a lot yet as feedback what we should prepare for. So thanks. Thank you. You can come forward. Uh, you can adjust that down. So uh, there were uh, a, a couple of big uh, infrastructure items in the budget, and you know we've also heard about the ugly. So in my mind, I'm kind of trying to figure out what are the priorities for the town. Can any of you speak to that? M maintaining the current levels of service, mitigating any negative impacts that might occur to the town's infrastructure, and also preserving public safety. And I think as the town has said, also protecting the environment. Okay, I have two people standing. Um, come on up. You can pull it right down. <laughs> you just angle it. Um, I just had a comment regarding some of the uses for the EMC areas. I have concerns about all those buildings being put up First, you know, not being used, and raising four children in this community, and knowing the um, lack of ability for kids to have a place to go, I would love for the somehow the town to look at using one of those buildings as a youth organization for the town, take the pressure off the schools to have the the dances, the whatever that they need, because there is nothing for the kids to do around socializing. And that area would be a nice area <clears throat> to use for something like that. I think the, the parents of the town would see some of this risk around all this use of drugs and marijuana be decreased if they could get together and have something of their own to plan and to do around activities. That's all I have, a comment. Thank you. Uh, we do have a representative from the, uh, the zoning board. Nope, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see John ready to answer that question. I, I think what he was probably about to say is that while those are, are worthy goals, these are private properties, um, and uh, it would be up to someone negotiating with a property owner or purchasing the property and taking one of those uses. For the town to do it, we would have to consider buying the property, and we already have impacts on our budget. Did I steal your thunder? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it really would be great if, if we, the town had the money to go in there and, and buy, like right now, the, the town is presently in 80 South Street, you know, to, to, to use, yeah, it's, it's been a very convenient, we were very lucky to have it available to us when we lost the uh, downtown town hall. And it's been very convenient. I've had people come to come up to me and say, you know, there's, there's parking, they can go right in front, everything's on one floor, no elevators, no stairs. Um, but um, again, it's, um, it means uh, money. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, eventually we have to look for a, uh, for a second uh, fire station right around that same area. You know, so uh, you know, there's this, we have the need and, and we have the want, but it's the, uh, it's the money. And uh, you know, can we afford it? And, and we'd love to. You know, it, it, you know, we, we at this, side, this end love buying things also. But we, we have to be the ones that have to say, you know, can we afford it? And, and then come to town meeting and say, what does everybody think? So yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a great thought. And we have the center, reuse, center School Reuse Committee. And, and we're looking and seeing if, if any of that is viable. Um, you know, reworking that can be also very expensive, but we, have a, we do own the buildings right now. We might be able to do something with them. So we're, we're trying to look at everything and then just trying to do what's um, fiscally responsible and, and what will give us the biggest bang for the buck. 
And did you have a question? I did. Um, and while I hate to circle back to marijuana, um, I have a couple of qu questions or suggestions for the town moderator. Um, the first is that I would suggest we perhaps take Article 40 first, because that only requires a majority. And if we, if the prohibition with a majority um, passes, then we don't need to address the two-thirds majority. Um, and second, that if we do it in that order and the prohibition fails on the majority vote, um, might we have the option to, within the four corners of Article 37, um, propose some more narrowed um, restrictions on where those shops can go, equivalent to what we have for medical marijuana facilities? Because otherwise, we'll default to the state rules. I'll take it under advisement. <laughs> I, I would also comment, uh, the town manager reminded me that if, if people know in advance that they want to propose amendments to any of the warrant articles, um, they're encouraged to bring those to the town manager in advance of town meeting, not to change the nature of the amendment, but rather to uh, vet the amendment to be sure that it's uh, not in conflict with anything you know, relating to state law. Uh, the town manager will, will pass it along to town council and you know, he can confirm that the, the wording is, is something that doesn't uh, pose a problem with respect to uh, state law or conflict with some other aspect of our town bylaws. I'm going to ask the two people standing in line, do you have a question about uh, the marijuana dispensaries? No, I have a response. Okay, come on up. And then I have to... And the town moderator can tell me if I'm outside the four corners of this discussion. Um, but hello, I'm the library director here in town, and so when I hear a comment about needing activities for children and teens in town to keep them occupied, I just have to say something. Um, and we have a beautiful new building. Um, we have a gigantic new children's room. We have a teen space for the first time. And one of the things that we are working to do at your library is to try to fill some, we can't fill all of it, but some of that gap and provide a lot of new activities and engaging spaces for the youth in town to come and use productively. And I know my staff are going flat out trying to add as much as they can as fast as they can to meet the demand. So, thank you. Thank you. I have one question. Um, I have an email that's been waiting here for a while, so I do have to get it out. And it's for Mr. DeYoung with the Planning Board. Um, to what degree have traffic concerns around the Main Street, Lumber Street intersection been taking into account when proposing expanding the hotel overlay district in hopes to attract a uh, hotel to Hockington? So there's a number of studies that are done, oftentimes initiated by the proponents. It's not working? Is it on now? Okay. Um, there's studies that are uh, provided by um, consultants or engineers from the proponent. Uh, we also utilize the beta group, which is essentially the uh, uh, council, the engineering council that the town utilizes to vet and corroborate um, and validate um, the studies that are done on behalf of the proponent as well. So there's a number of different elements that go into effect when we review traffic and that is then kind of brought into the overall discussion uh, depending on the type of project that the proponent is trying to bring forth. So think of it as um, one or two groups that come into play will kind of look at state, federal type of guidelines to make recommendations and changes to any particular project. Elaine, is there anything else that uh, I might be missing? I'd just like to add that even though the land area of the hotel overlay district is proposed to be increased, the number of hotels is still limited to two townwide one on the east side of 495 and one on the west side. So even though the possible land area on which a hotel could be located would be increased, the number of hotels would be capped at two still. Okay, and one more email question related to this Actually, issue. I'll, I'll, I'll just give a, a, a zoning advisory committee a view on it. What happened was we, for, for several years, we've had this same overlay district out there and it didn't seem to attract anybody. So we just figured maybe if we just went across the street and tried that, maybe we'll get one. And so it was really just trying to see if we could possibly attract uh, a hotel to try and uh, come right off of 495. And I think this question is directly related to what you just said. And it's, uh, is the east side of 495 the best spot to attempt to draw a hotel? Could we, or should we, push harder for South Street's empty buildings? 
Um, I, I believe we did tweak. We can, we, yeah. So the expansion is proposed on the east side and the west side to include all of um, South Street, basically from Hayward Street to the Milford Town Line, in the industrial A overlay in the industrial A district. But on with, when it comes to some of the EMC buildings, there was not. Uh, we did not expand it to the the more residential side of South Street, just for that reason, because we didn't want the hotels abutting the residences. Oh, thank you. And did you have a question? Again, let me know if I'm outside the four corners. I wanted to ask about strategic long-range planning. So one of the things that's striking me in the forums I've been to in the past few months and here again today, it feels as though I have a very disparate collective of different departments. You're all definitely supporting the same town. You all eat at the same table, but it does not feel like you buy groceries together, nor are you cooking the same meal. Sorry for the metaphors, folks. Here's my question. We've got a bunch of independent departments with independent budgets and independent needs. What are we doing to forecast looking three, five, and ten years in the future so that I believe as it was put, we don't have the circumstances that occurred this year in which we had the 55 million from the tax expenses that were voted by the town, plus we need a tractor and we need new infrastructure. I'm looking to understand what our lessons learned here are and what we're actually going to do differently the next time. This seems to be an, I will say, opportunity for improved planning. I want to know that this group understands that and understand what they're doing about it. Uh, I, I believe uh, that it is outside the four corners. Nevertheless, I think it's appropriately within the four corners of a typical Board of Selectmen meeting. Okay. And I do have a financial question um, on Facebook. Our financial tax situation does not seem great looking ahead. What are we doing to increase commercial tax revenue or any other means of revenue beyond residential? We're trying to exp we tried to expand the uh, the hotel overlay district. We're 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 working um, hard with the chamber of commerce to try and try and attract businesses. We um, we have our, our you know AAA uh, bond rating. You know we're, we're, we're you know, fiscally you know uh, people keep coming back that 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 we're in tough times. We really aren't. You know we just we did have two two underrides in order to, to increase transparency. I heard a lot of, I heard t talk before that, that underrides decrease, decrease transparency. It's absolutely opposite. Because without the underrides, the Board of Selectmen could just raise taxes six, eight, ten percent and not have to go to town meeting. So, so getting rid of excess levy capacity actually re removes that. And, and, and you know, when, when, when a town is, is strong, you know, we're, we're a, you know, we're, we're considered a, a vibrant, welcoming community. We have a vision statement. That, now, that's one of the things we wanted to put up in, in all of our public buildings. So people understand, you know, that, that Hopkinton does have a vision statement. And, you know, we, we do have great, great natural resources. We're, a, we're an edu well-educated community. We have great schools, great place to live. And so, you know, we're just hoping that um, businesses continue to notice that. We're right off 495, right off the Mass Pike. You know, I'm, I guess I'm doing a commercial myself. Um, you know, but we really are centrally located right, right, in, the, right in the middle of New England. And it's not just centrally, centrally located in, in Massachusetts, right in, right in New England. You know, we're, we're looking to, to um, you know, base, the, base an international marathon center just on the, on the, on the east side of town. You know, there's, you know things that, that will, will bring people not only regionally but internationally. You know, we have the... Um, the marathon that comes here every year. So for one weekend a year, we're, we're, we're very vibrant and everybody wants to be here. It's a great place to be, but we, well, we're trying to expand upon that footprint and trying to get people to come here year round. So, you know, hopefully when all this, we get, we get all this working together with, you know, we have been working well with the planning board and, and, and Parks and Rec and all the other departments, the marathon committee, the marathon uh, fund committees and everything to try and get all of that working together. You know, again, maybe getting a hotel or something like that. We did raise the hotel taxes two years ago, but we still haven't got a hotel. <laughs> Thank you. We have one more audience question. Hi, Mr. Kumalo, especially. Um, you had mentioned um, infrastructure and protecting the environment. So it brings to mind to me does that cover the most basic chore of picking up the litter? 
I mean, it's so elementary. Every roadway in this town, it looks like a drive-through dump. And it seems like, what budget does that come under? What agency is supposed to cover it? And why has it literally fallen through the cracks? Because it defaces the whole aspect of the town. That, that's a good question. Um, it falls under the DPW budget, i.e. trash collection and management. We also rely on volunteer efforts here in town. Uh, we have also tapped into, for lack of a better w phrase, prison labor. Uh, we have um, invited um, gang, prison gangs to come and work with the DPW to move some of the litter. Again, as, as Mr. Cotino said, we, we, we are central in Massachusetts in many ways. One of the things is that we, we have 135, we have 85, we have 495. So the, the, the chances or the probability of having cars going through the town um, and, and, and dumping litter are pretty high. However, I think our, the answer to your question is the money is in the DPW budget. Our efforts include using our DPW personnel and relying on volunteers as well as uh, 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 inviting uh, prison gangs to work gangs, prison work gangs to come and work with our DPW folk. If I may add one item to that, um, what was it, a year ago the town implemented uh, trash and recycling carts which went a long way to limiting the amount of trash that could blow on the streets from people's recycling, from people's trash. So that also went a long way to, to trying to limit. We would appreciate it if people would hold on to their trash and their litter until they reached a receptacle to be able to dispose of it properly, as opposed to the, um, the other alternative, which leads to litter on the sides of the roads. If I may just follow up a little bit on that one also. And people may have noticed in the last two years, um, due to the efforts of uh, Mr. Westling and the DPW department, that um, we don't have as much sand um, in the spring anymore. Um, he implemented um, just using treated salt. So in, in years past, we had um, the sweeper trucks out there trying to sweep up all the sand. And um, by instituting this new policy, not only do we, did we save money, it didn't seem like it this year in the snow removal budget, but we had a lot more snow. But we ended up saving money on that end, and then we also were able to save money in, um, in, the, in the pickup bu uh, budget. And then people who, who ride bikes or motorcycles will know that it, you, you were able to get out a lot sooner this year on your, on your bikes because uh, there was less sand on the roads. Could I just follow up? I'm not even so much talking about the individual little streets. I'm, I mean, if you drive by 85 by the Hoffman State Park, you look on either side, it's just trash that's been thrown out the window and never gets picked up. And there's only so, I, I'm a volunteer constantly picking up litter, and there's only so much individuals can do with the main road like that. You can't get out and risk your life. So it's more like the epidemic of it. Um, maybe we need more prison help, but, or volunteers can only do so much. It needs to be institutionalized that we just stop this, you know, this um, allowing of it. It just has to be picked up and kept up with. So, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, at this point in the forum, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mr. Garabedian, the town moderator. Uh, he does have an announcement to make about changes to town meeting this year. Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, the town clerk, Connor Deegan, to come up as well. <laughs> we should probably both stand for this. Uh, his eyesight may be better than mine, <laughs> but he's, uh, he's worked with the votes organization to put this slide together. Uh, again, I mentioned at the outset that we're going to be piloting electronic voting. The purpose of electronic voting uh, is to enhance the accuracy of the votes and enhance the speed through which votes are taken and the and tabulation of the votes are reported back to town meeting. Uh, there, you know, we, we've explored uh, through the votes organization, which is a startup based in Boston, um, a mobile-based approach 
This means that you should um, well follow the procedures that we have identified here, and Connor will go through that. But basically, uh, conceptually, you bring your smartphone or you bring your tablet to town meeting, and that will serve as a vehicle for uh, casting of a vote on any of the Warren articles that we, that we choose to pilot. Uh, it will be a secure process, and Connor will do a little explanation of, uh, of that process and of the, the website that you should go to to download, download the appropriate app. Uh, and by the way, if you don't have a smartphone, if you don't have a tablet, or if you run out of power at the meeting, the vendor is going to be providing a number of tablets that will be available for use at the meeting uh, in the event that you don't have your own device or that it's run out of uh, juice. Thank you, Tom. Couldn't have put it better for myself on that one. But uh, essentially the process will be that we'll have the opportunity to uh, find cost savings on hardware but still using electronic voting as opposed to uh, the more antiquated clicker system that some towns have used. Uh, one of the bonuses here is you can also give reminders using the application if people opt in to do so that town meetings are coming up, whether it's a special town meeting or just the annual, so that people can be aware of those dates, which many people don't notice when it is. So it's just another avenue to try and get that out as well. Uh, before the meeting, what we'd ask you to do is if you do want to use your personal device, it is anonymous. So this would be the first time we'd be implementing uh, secret ballot essentially for town meeting votes. Uh, we can keep hard receipts. It's an option that we have with them at no extra charge to uh, have receipts printed in real time of the votes, but they would still be anonymous for everyone who's signed in as a registered voter. Um, you can actually download the app ahead of time and do any of the setup. It's just, uh, it's called Votes, V-O-A-T-Z. And I actually put the link right up here uh, that they provided us so that you can actually see user manuals for both Android and for iOS. And it'll also allow you to download the app from the Play Store and from the Apple Store. It also allows for a few FAQs that are on there so that you can kind of look at what other communities are looking at, asking about it, and what are some of the common questions, including ones that we asked when we kind of talked to votes. We had quite a few questions for them about security of the votes and people's identities uh, and also just how we handle things like if there's someone in the audience who isn't very familiar with technology and maybe they also don't have the ability to walk up to uh, into a line and use a uh, tablet of some kind that's offered by the town and by the, uh, the vendor. And actually, that was my biggest concern. And the first thing they said was, well, that's the best part about a tablet is you can have a volunteer just hand it right to someone who might have difficulty. Uh, we're going to have dozens of these tablets available to try and mitigate the challenge for any voters who are there. But the, the real driver to make this work well will be, you know, download this app ahead of time and try it out on your phones. and. Uh, it'll actually be a, a really, hopefully a really efficient way to get these vote counts. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions. I see Amy's already up to ask me something. Hi, Connor. Um, originally, yeah. I was a little bit worried about this because I was afraid that it might affect the, um, the voting in the voting booth, and apparently it does not. It's only for the town meeting. And I looked up votes just before I came over here. It sounds like they're using blockchain technology, so I'm happy about that. So generally, I'm cautiously optimistic. I noticed that it doesn't get a whole lot of really good ratings um, when I download it. So I'm wondering, do you have a backup in case the whole thing crashes? So we're just going to raise our hands. And so we do have the wonderful backup of the old-fashioned way. Uh, if if it some for some reason something doesn't go right and we're not impressed with them, the fortunate part of the pilot is we're not locked into anything with this. This is just us testing out, seeing if we might want to do it for future town meetings. And we might decide after trying it out that it's just they're not the, the company for us on this. But uh, yeah, if, if it turns out that we, uh, something's gone wrong technology-wise and their staff that are on site aren't able to help us and IT can't figure it out, then yeah, we can go back to holding up the, the cards for that vote if we need to do a count. Okay, and if I could ask a follow-on question. Um, 
I gather it must be storing some personal data because if you're going to send us updates between town meetings, right, you're going to, you need to know who we are. So store some personal data. So most of the data, I've done a little exploring on it. Most of the data is entirely optional to put on there. The only information that it actually takes as to your location and what events you might be involved in is your zip code. Um, since Hopkinton only has one zip code and we don't share with any other towns, it would only send you data based on that zip code. If you needed more accurate information, you could put in your address or any of that other information. Okay. Thank you. Very welcome. Excuse me, I just wish to point out that Hopkinton has <laughs> two zip codes. Don't denigrate Woodville. Just a, a quick point out there, only the post office has the 01784. I'm told Connor. last question. Sorry, we, oh, okay. we got to wrap up. We got to wrap up. All right, very quickly. So, um, first of all, thanks for trying this out. I saw you pitch it to the selectmen, bringing us into the new technology. The question I have, though, is um, people who are at home will not have the availability to vote, correct? The law still states that you must be within the bounds of the hall to be voting. So, no one will be able to vote on this from home, it does not allow remote participation. Uh, we will actually have a system that they've set up, or, and they will set up for it, that will use blue tech, Bluetooth technology to prevent anyone who has left the bounds of the hall from being able to cast a vote using the application. Thank you. Very welcome. And if anyone has any other questions, uh, the moderator and I can answer different questions about it. Uh, I've included, a, I've released a, a press release from the moderator and myself, and we will be able to take questions if people want to send us emails, phone calls, anything uh, as we approach town meeting. And we're going to be working to try and get some more information out as we go through this week. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Taking the hook out now. Um, pulling you off stage. <laughs> You're out. Yeah. All right. Um, so this year, uh, we've had record uh, attendance at our meeting. Um, we've also had record uh, comments coming in from Facebook and email. So I just want to acknowledge that we haven't addressed all of them, uh, but we will try to follow up as quickly as we can on Facebook. Um, and I want to thank our panelists. and really appreciate your time. Um, and as I mentioned before, I understand that this is, we can't look at this in a bubble. This is eight months of your life on top of your, your regular job that it takes to put this together. So we really appreciate it. Uh, and not to mention the, the late night meetings that you guys have to attend. Um, so just to reiterate, yes, you may. If, if you could forward the questions on to sure. Town Hall and, mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Kamalo and his, and his staff will make sure they get to the right people. We'll see if we can answer some of them before town meeting or we'll, uh, at town meeting. Absolutely. Thank you. Can I, sorry, can I just add to that? Yeah. All, all of us have public email addresses, so I mean, this is a fantastic opportunity, but by no means should you limit yourselves to asking questions only in this venue. So you should email all of us all of the time with questions that you have. Um, and so we will make it's our responsibility to get you answers. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. Uh, you made this night what it was, so I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure all of you are going to go to town meeting uh, on Monday, May 7th, but get your friends to come to town meeting as well. Uh, there's a lot of really important articles um, that are going to be brought to this town meeting. And then town election, which I knew I was going to blank on this. Oh, May 21st, <laughs> uh, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the middle school. Uh, you vote on the ballot. Um, but thank you all, and have a great night. Thank you.